Wow. Brothers and sisters, elders y hermanos, bienvenidos. It is truly a sight to see you all. Um, great to have you guys here. I was telling my wife on the way up that when I got set apart as a missionary, my state president blessed me with the ability to make some lifelong friends. And that was the one thing that stuck in my head and I remember it. So that's why this is so great to get together. We all served in a wonderful mission and made a strong bond and a friendship. And so it's beautiful to see you guys here today. And obviously we're very excited to have Sister Martino and, and President Elder Martino here. Um, just want to give you guys kind of a heads up on what we're going to do. Um, first thing we'll do is have the opening hymn. We're going to sing Yamados a Servir. I think that's how you say it. The accent's gone, but I remember. Um, so hopefully everyone has a paper. Oh, oh okay. okay. Are we doing English? Okay, thank you. We're going to do Call to Serve, which is hymn number 249. Thank you. Um, after the opening hymn, Call to Serve, we'll, we'll have our opening prayer by Brother Brad Franzen. Um, following Brother Francis' prayer, we'll have the special musical number by Megan Willerson Doherty, who will be singing, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. After the special musical number, we'll be pleased to hear from Sister Martino, followed by uh, President Martino. Following their remarks, we'll have our closing hymn, which hopefully you have this paper, Llevaremos su verdad al mundo. And following that, our closing prayer by Brother David Mitchell. Uh, we will now have our opening hymn. And we thank Sister Megan Wilson Doherty for conducting and Brother Schumacher for playing the piano.
It is so wonderful to be here with you. I wanted to stop and look at every face and remember some wonderful memories that we had together in Venezuela. <laughs> Does a day ever go by that you don't think about Maracaibo, Venezuela? The wonderful experiences and challenges and uh, wonderful people and saints that we love there. I am so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to see you looking so wonderful. And there can't be a chapel tonight of better looking missionaries than these. I'm especially happy to be back in the United States, and I'm so happy to be able to speak in English tonight. <laughs> I know what I'm saying, and I can actually understand myself. <laughs> um, for those of you that don't know, my husband and I are back in, we're in Guatemala this time. We are there for three to five years. His assignment is a six-year assignment and we find out each April where we will be the next year. We haven't heard any rumors, so we're expecting to go back to Guatemala <coughs> next week and be back there. Uh, people are lovely, the country's beautiful. The high every day is in the 70s, and the low every night's in the 50s, just like near Cairo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely, but we just, every mission tour we go on, it's fun to be with the missionaries, but I just keep thinking, these aren't my missionaries. They're just not my missionaries, but they're great missionaries. I just want to share a few thoughts with you tonight. I remember in the mission talking to you about eating five fruits and vegetables a day and uh, Cloroxing all of your vegetables and fruits and um, cleaning your apartments and being a good companion. But all of those things are past. And uh, you're in different phases now. You are parents, you're having families, your spouses, you still need to be a good companion. And life has just moved on to a different phase to, for each of you. And I'm so happy to see that you've embraced these phases in your life. We love hearing from you on, at Christmas time and on Facebook. And when you have babies born and marriages, it's so fun to keep up with you. Traditions are different now. You're setting different traditions than you did in the mission. And I hope that you're setting traditions that will in, help you end up where you and your family want to be. You can't say, next year I'm going to start doing this, or when I have children, I'll start doing that. Now's the time. My husband and I had an opportunity last year of going um, to Panama <coughs> for a mission tour. No, it wasn't a mission tour, it was a state conference. And on Monday, we took a P-Day, and we got to go fishing in the Panama Canal. And it was lovely. We had such a good time. We went out the state president and another member of the high council, and went about an hour away on a little boat down the canal and fish, and we were catching great fish. We were having such a good time. But I kept looking at the sky, and these black clouds were rolling in. And I kept thinking, we've got to go. We've got to go. Here comes the rain. But you know what happens to men when they're catching fish? They stay there, and they just keep throwing that pole in the water. And I was just stewing. I caught the most fish. <laughs> but I didn't touch them. I just pulled <laughs> And here came the rain, and it was pelting us. We were, it was just stinging us, and we were sopping wet. And so we started heading back. We're an hour away. We started heading back to the dock. And our boat's kind of cutting along. It's not doing what it should be doing. And about three-fourths of the way there, it runs out of gas. We're in the middle of the canal. And you know how big we are compared to these ships? You know, they wouldn't even see us. They would just run right over us. We were able to put to the side a little bit and we had no way to get back. And it was lightning and thundering, and we're in this big body of water. And the president thought it was, you know, an adventure. And I was praying, and I was, I was very uncomfortable. So the state president gets on his cell phone and calls the little minnow man at the dock and asks him if he can bring us some gasoline. So we wait, and we wait, and we're shivering and freezing and putting our watches in all of the little glove box to try to keep things as dry as they can. And through this pouring rain, we see this little boat come down, coming through the canal. He's standing up with an umbrella over his head, talking on his cell phone. And he wasn't able to bring us any gasoline, but he did bring a rope. And he threw this rope to us, tied us to his boat, and started towing us back to the dock. 
Well, I was very glad to get back that day. I was so happy to see that little man with that little rope. And I thought of that rope that day as my lifeline. That's what was going to get me out of the bad situation I was in. And I thought about that so many times related to the gospel and how we have lifelines that are going to get us back to where we safely want to be. Back to the presence of our Heavenly Father. And the three things that that stick out most in my mind that we as parents now and as couples need to do to get us back safely to our Heavenly Father are prayer, personal prayer and family prayer, personal and family scripture study and family home evening every week. Have you ever known a family that did these three things and became inactive? I haven't. We have a grandson who is, when he was seven years old, he's nine now, his primary teacher challenged him to read the scriptures every day, his whole primary class, to read the scriptures every day for 100 days without missing a day. So he took this challenge on because she was going to make a treat for whatever, whatever treat they wanted, and he really liked her brownies. Plus, she said, you don't have to share this treat with your brothers and sisters if you accomplish this goal. So he was pretty happy. He read 10 days, and he missed a day. He went and asked his primary teacher if she could excuse him and he would keep going. She said, no, you have to start over. It's 100 consecutive days. This little seven-year-old started over again. He made it 15 days this time, and he missed a day. He went and begged for forgiveness again. She shook her head, you got to start over. It's 100 days to establish a habit. He started over again. It has now been 25 months. And this nine-year-old has never missed a single day of reading his scriptures. Pretty amazing, isn't it, that we can do that, that he can do that. This same daughter and her husband are being very faithful at reading their scriptures every day as a family. They went to the temple last Friday night, and the friends were keeping their three children overnight. They got to the temple and realized they had not read the scriptures that day. And they didn't want to let their children down. They were already dressed. Their cell phone was in the car. They went to the front desk and said, is there any way we could use the phone for just five minutes? They let them use the phone in the Washington, D.C. temple. They got their scriptures, called their children to the base that are called to the phone, put them on speakerphone, and they read their scriptures from the temple over speakerphone just so they didn't miss a day. I would challenge you to make sure that this is a goal of yours, that you're reading the scriptures with your children, even if they cannot understand they're, they know and they're getting that tradition down of reading the scriptures every day. We had a son and a little grandson last year, seven years old. Uh, his father was leaving for work that morning. He said his personal prayers, but on the way to work, felt like he needed to pull over and pray for his family that day. He was late for work. He thought, I can't pull over on the freeway. But this feeling kept prompting him, and he pulled over, prayed for his family that day. That evening, he was home with the children. His wife was at a, a young woman's activity. He'd gone out in the field to get hay and come back in. This little boy gets to ride in the back of the pickup against my, against my rules, but he let him ride in the back of the pickup. This little grandson jumped out of the pickup without my son-in-law knowing about it, and he ran over him. This was a big truck. It ran over the little boy's stomach and his leg. Didn't realize it until he got out and heard our grandson just screaming. He picked him up and put him in the truck and raced to the hospital. Our daughter called us and said, please pray for Brady. He's on his way to the hospital. Jason has run over here in the truck. Of course, my husband and I just dropped to our knees and started praying for this little grandson. Got to the hospital. They told him the little boy had died previously that day from his father running over him in the truck also. They checked our grandson. He had abrasions and bruises. He had not one broken bone. He had absolutely nothing wrong with him except some broken skin. What if his father had not pulled over that morning and prayed for his family? What if he had ignored the promptings of the Spirit to pray for his family that day? The other thing I would encourage you to do is have family home evening with your sweet little children and your spouse every single week. I promise you they will not always love it. Ours didn't. Many of you know our fourth daughter, Lauren, that came to Venezuela with us. She did not like family home evening, mainly because this sweet man behind me taught too long of lessons. <laughs> and always had his scriptures out. And she would say, how long is it going to be? How long is the lesson? And when he would get to that minute, she would say, time's up. Time's up, Dad. 
Mom, don't say anything. Don't bear your testimony or anything. Time is up. <laughs> she did this all of these years growing up. We just had to keep doing this. She brought her fiance down to meet us the summer, before, the summer they got married. And he told us that Lauren made him promise that if she married him, they would have family meeting every week, just like when she was growing up. My mouth dropped open and I was in utter shock that she would want to do something that she disliked for 17 years so badly. And yet it made a difference and it will make a difference with your children. I read something the other day that said, next to the temple, our homes are the most sacred places on earth. But it's up to us to make those homes a sacred place. And by doing these things, we will make them sacred. I want you to know that I have a testimony of this gospel. I know it's true. I know my Savior lives. I know He's the Son of God. I know He atoned for our sins. And I know that the things we do here will determine our eternity. And it's so important that we do these things, that we set these new traditions in our lives, and we teach these things to our children. I love each of you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so honored to have served with you. I'm so honored to know you. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As Sister Martino said, it is a wonderful evening for us to be with each of you. To look at your faces. To have memories come flooding back as we, as I look at faces and I remember places you served, things that you've done. Some of you we haven't seen in over 10 years. Uh, I see one back there that was my trainer. You think, what do you mean, was your trainer? I said, yeah, he was. But Martin, I was really my trainer. I didn't know what a mission president was supposed to do. He was the first assistant. All of those things. It's fun to have these memories come flooding back of experiences that we had together. Since we were in Maracaibo together, you're aware that they they have formed three new stakes since we were there. They have formed the Maracaibo West Stake. They have divided the Maracaibo Sur Stake so that there's now Maracaibo Sur and San Francisco. They have formed the I don't remember if it's called the Punto Fijo Stake. I assume it is, or the Falcone Stake. It's one of the two. <clears throat> and there is another stake that has been approved that will be created before too many months are gone by. And there's another one that, and I'm not, I can't tell you where these are, <clears throat> but there's another one that has had the application turned in for. So you can just dream of where maybe you wanted some stakes and all that. Maybe some of the places you wanted stakes, and I wanted stakes, still aren't quite there, but they're working on them. Uh, some of you knew President Herrera in Merida. President Herrera will be finishing up his mission president in Caracas in July. We'll be going back to Merida. Uh, there are two Area 70 from Venezuela. Maybe there's three. Two of them are in the Maracaibo mission. One lives in Merida, which is Elder Mestre. He, was a, he is a Maracucho, but he was living when most of us were there in Caracas, I think, and later became a mission president in Barcelona. And then many of you knew Javier Ibanez, who was mission president in Barcelona, but later was a counselor to me from San Cristobal and a state president in San Cristobal. He's in Area 70. Church is growing. Mission's a little different. Still, there are virtually only Venezolanos that are serving in Venezuela. Um, I have seen, because I get the list of the, of the missionary assignments, I have seen some recent assignments of some missionaries that would be going there from Argentina and a few others, but I understand that the difficulty is, is it's about a six to eight month wait to get a visa to be able to get into Venezuela. There are no North Americans there, and so in total there's only about a hundred missionaries in the Maracaibo mission. Uh, baptisms are not where they were when we were there. But, but they are baptizing at about the average of Latin America, which is about, the Latin American average right now is about, oh, 8.8 .8 to 9 baptisms per missionary per year, per month. Must be per month. No, it's, it must not be per year, per year. I have to think what these numbers are. When we were there, it was about, we were doing about 
I was somewhere around, must have been about 25. So it's come down. But, it, but they're doing well. Uh, I've heard some wonderful stories about many of the saints that are there. Interestingly, too, you might want to know, the temple in Caracas is very busy. In fact, there are times that they, you have to make appointments to get in. And the area that attends the temple, more than any other area, according to El Dardino, the general authority that's from Venezuela, he said it's the people from Maracaibo that attend the temple, even more than the people from Caracas. But that there is a tremendous faithfulness in members of the church that attend the temple. This story happens to be from, from Guatemala. But it is interesting how much of a temple attending people many of the Latins are. Three weeks ago in Guatemala, we had 1,500 people show up in the Guatemala City Temple. Now you have to understand that the endowment room is built to hold 28 people. There's four endowment rooms, but they were putting 42 in a session because they're benches. So they would say, okay, you sit up, you sit back, you turn to the side, and all of this, just to fit in as many as they possibly could. And there were three complete stakes that were not even allowed to go into the temple at all. They just never had a chance to get in. Even after waiting four and five hours to do a temple session. I've seen the blessings of the temple. I've seen what it does to the young people. I've seen what it does to the members. Hopefully, and I know nothing, so I'm not saying anything that I know anything about. Hopefully, the day will come when Maracaibo will have a temple. I can share now, a few of you were there, when I'll never forget, when we got a telegram, we got a fax into the office. Some of you that are here may have been the office elders that received that fax, but the fax came in and it said, for President Martino only. Well, all of a sudden I get this telephone call because we were out on a mission tour. And they said, President, you got a fax today. I said, well, what does it say? He said, well, it says for you only. And I said, well, have you read it? Well, of course, because we knew you'd want to know what it is. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, then tell me what it says. It says, President Hinckley's coming to Maracaibo. And it says, don't tell anybody. And I said, how many of you told? <laughs> not many, President. Not many. <laughs> was one of those incredible experiences to be able to drive for four hours with me driving, President Hinckley in the front seat, Elder Oaks in the back seat. I believe in the middle seat was Elder Sayer's father, who was the security person for President Hinckley, and then the Secretary for President Hinckley in the third seat with our son back there as well. And I'm going to share another thing because it means so much to some of your Venezuelan companions and others. I'll probably never have an experience like this again. We were walking around on a piece of property. And President Hinckley looked at me and he said, President Martino, what happens? to your Venezuelan missionaries when they go home. And I said, well, many of them try to go back to school, but a lot of them don't have the means to do so, and so they go find whatever employment they can, and we don't change the cycle quite like what we need to. And President Hinckley looked at me and he said, I've received a revelation. I'm going to announce it at General Conference. Actually, I believe he announced it at Relief Society Conference in March of 2001. And it was the Perpetual Education Fund. Which has been the means to give the opportunity to many, in fact, the majority of those Venezuelans that served as missionaries to have an opportunity to become educated. And many of them are being educated. 
some of your companions down there, if some of you are companions with Elder. Oh, mind you, Perasa. Perasa, thank you. Elder Perasa, my mind went blank for just a second. Elder Perasa was a bishop. He actually moved back to Maracaibo while, while we were still there. He was called as a bishop before we came home. He's now in the state presidency of either Maracaibo Sur or, or, or San Francisco, one of the two. Several are bishops. Many are doing well. Some are not doing as well as they need to be. You know, one of the scriptures that, that I continue to ponder as I read, because it's so incredible when you think about it. I'm sure you've thought about it. When we read about the converts of the sons of Mosiah, and it talks about the thousands that, that were converted to the truth that never did fall away. And I think about that over and over, and I say, what did they do to never fall away? I wish I could say that. I'm back now in an area of presidency in the place where I served as a missionary. So I had the chance of going back and visiting some of the people I knew as a missionary. It's incredible. Those that have remained faithful, that have paid tithing and remained faithful. They may have been here amongst the poor when they were baptized. But every single one, without an exception, have not only progressed spiritually, but they've progressed incredibly temporally as well. One of the families I worked with in a little town called Sakapa, One of the young kids who was four years old when I was there is in Area 70. The two-year-old was just released as a state president and is now getting his MBA at MIT from this little bitty pueblo de Cito, Guatemala. But here's what happens when we begin to make changes. What happened to these Lamanite converts of the sons of Messiah? As all I've pondered on it, I think the answer primarily can be found in the verse preceding what I just read, where it says, And thousands were brought to the knowledge of the Lord. Yea, thousands were brought to believe in the traditions of the Nephites. Let's change that. Thousands were brought to believe in the traditions of the Latter-day Saints. When we become converted, our converts and us as missionaries, we begin to take upon ourselves the traditions of the Latter-day Saints. What else did these Lamanites have to do? It says they became a righteous people, that they did lay down their weapons of their rebellion, that they might not fight against God anymore. There's a dual process here that has to happen in all of our lives. When we need to make changes in our lives, when we need to repent, we have to somehow bury the weapons of war or the bury the weapons that, that would fight against God, against whatever He's asked us to do, and bury those. But at the same time that we bury those weapons, we have to create within us new traditions that draw us closer to our Heavenly Father. My guess is that every one of your converts that you baptized, all of those many families that we were able to bring into the church, at least when they joined the church, they'd stop drinking coffee, they'd committed to pay tithing, they'd stop smoking, they'd stop doing that. They'd made these changes. But if they didn't begin to put in the place of things that they were leaving behind, new traditions, then my guess is those old traditions begin to creep back in. And so the key for the missionary and the key for the convert is what do we do with our traditions? Sister Martino talked about some of that. 
I go around to several state conferences and I ask a question. If you had five things, and that's all, that you could ask your converts or yourself to never fail in doing, what would they be? Three of them Sister Martina mentioned, because I agree with her totally. Family home evening, or noche de hogar. Prayer. I'm going to do it in Spanish for a reason here. Oración. Scripture study. Or estudio de las escrituras. Noche de hogar. Oración. Estudio de las escrituras. If you take the first letter of all of those, it spells Noé. Noé, or in English, Noah, was the prophet that warned about things that had to be done, that they needed to change, to be able to be protected from the floods or from the challenges or trials that they were going to receive. Our prophecy of Noah, we teach to the Latins, is that they're in Noé, is to have their noche de hogar, they are sus oraciones personales y de familia, el estudio de las escrituras, so that they could be able to have that protection. If you add to those three the payment of tithe <coughs> and the attendance at church, I don't even have to mention word of wisdom. I don't even have to mention law of chastity. And I'm not going to say that some people aren't going to have a problem with one of those. But if they do, and they keep doing the other five things, what's going to happen? They're going to repent. And they're going to come back. But if we'll do those five things sincerely, we ourselves will be converted. And so are our converts. Now I'm talking to you about your converts, son, because I hope that you're still keeping in touch with most of them in some way. And I know you're thinking, but I don't even know how to reach them anymore. Well, then write a letter to the last warder branch that they, were, that they were in that you know of and see if the missionaries can't find them. It might be that letter that they can go hand to somebody and rekindle feelings in their hearts that they've had before. It's amazing in the Book of Mormon how many times the prophets use the word remember. This reunion is bringing to memory for us to remember, both you and for us, to remember many, many things that went on. Now the missionary work, they've changed it considerably from when we were there. We had those missionary discussions that we learned, and I remember going out with a few of you, and, and it really confused us when, they did, when the investigator didn't answer the way the book said they were supposed to answer the question. And I sat with some of you before, and I'm not going to say who they were, that you'd keep asking the question, and I'd say, move on. But they didn't answer it the way the book said. Well, thank goodness we've moved beyond that missionary work, and they have preached my gospel, and they're really supposed to be doing it more with the Spirit. But I'll, I'll admit it to you. We're struggling with the missionaries out there now because all they've done is they've memorized their own lessons. And they teach the same first lesson and the same second lesson and the same third lesson to every one of their investigators. And they haven't learned to really rely upon the Spirit and let the Spirit direct them. But what it really does is it hopefully we can let the gospel sink into the hearts of the missionaries. We were in a mission tour in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, just a couple of weeks ago. And the mission president had asked the two of the missionaries to give me the baptismal challenge. And I let them, and they did. And I told them they were great preachers, but they weren't very good teachers. They didn't ask me enough questions and all that. And one of the things that the mission presidents are asked to teach the missionaries now is a lot about the doctrine of Christ. Particularly as, as it's found in 2 Nephi chapter 31, or 3 Nephi chapter 11, or 3 Nephi chapter 27, where it talks a lot about the importance of faith, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, enduring to the end, and things like that. 
But I remember them pulling up two missionaries, and I gave them the challenge. And we went through it, and they thought I was, they thought I was going to give them the baptismal challenge, but instead, I said it this way. I said, Elder, I said, if you don't English, will you follow the example of Jesus Christ and be obedient as a missionary? Just as our Savior, Jesus Christ, was obedient to what His Father asked Him to do. And what we tried to do was to tie in where they would see that the principles they're teaching apply to the missionary as much as the investigator. I hope that you have seen that habits that we tried to get you to form Doctrines that we tried to get you to teach were really to convert you. And if you were converted, you were going to convert the missionaries, the, the investigators. But the goal of the mission president is to convert the missionary and help them to realize the practices and habits or things that we want you to continue to do. We're pushing Central America. I'm almost hesitant to ask you this question. We didn't have Preach My Gospel, so we didn't push it quite as hard, but you'll recall we had several zone conference trainings where you were supposed to have a plan, plan A and a plan B. So if something fell through, you knew what you were going to do, and you just didn't waste time on all of those things. <coughs> now they've got what's called Chapter 8 in Preach My Gospel, where they're supposed to really be learning how to set goals and to, and to, to, to organize what they're going to do and all those kinds of things. And so what we've started to do is to go around to all of our return missionaries that come back to Central America and ask them to show us their planner now that they've come home. And ask us how well they're doing on setting goals now. <coughs> Working to accomplish things still. Organize their day so that they're effective and efficient with their time. So that they have enough time to raise a righteous family in Zion. It's a tremendous demand today to support a family. I would have loved to have had a 40-hour work week sometime. I don't think I ever had a 40-hour work week. I'm not sure I ever had a 50-hour work week. <laughs> but you've got to learn how to balance it all. You've got to learn how to work, make what the priorities are. And what the problem is when we're in the mission field, you concentrate totally on missionary work. You don't worry about all the other things. And then all of a sudden, we send you home, and you got the pressures of family, you got the pressures of, you know, dating and marriage and all of this. And we can talk about dating in just a minute for some of you that might not be married. <laughs> but we, but we also talk about the pressures of the financial struggles, education, and everything just seems to come upon you. And if you don't learn to make good decisions and to set priorities, I see too many that come home, and they're so busy doing the small things that they lose sight of the big things. And that's where the principles that hopefully you learn, you continue to apply in your lives. Now for the few of you that are out there that aren't married, and even President Monson has mentioned to the general authorities this same topic I'm going to mention, and you may hear at a general conference this weekend, young single adults have lost the art of dating. They do things as groups. I see some smiles of some that may be agreeing with me, but we've lost the art of dating. I was with, I've been with a couple of our missionaries that were with us uh, that have actually I've seen in Central America. One I saw in Guatemala and one I saw in Nicaragua. With some of these, we do some dental brigadas that come down. And I've seen two of them. Neither one of them are married. And they've told me, I just haven't felt the sparks like I need to. I said, well, stop going out just as groups. you got to go out on a date. you got to do some things. 
and on. So my only counsel would be, you know where you are, each one of you. Some of you have families with many children. Some have families, marriages, and the children haven't come into your family yet, but they will before long. Some of you are engaged, and some of you haven't found that eternal companion. Set goals. Look what you need to do. Be sure that you're progressing. Be sure you're growing. And things are happening in your lives that the Lord can shower upon you the blessings that you need. They don't always come when we want them or how we want them. This past Sunday, I spoke in a, I was asked to speak in a Relief Society class. And we talked about the woman at the well. And the Savior came up to the Samaritan woman and promised to her the living waters. It's interesting to me, and those of us that have been in Latin America understand it a little bit, although you see it, you understand it even more in Central America. Because there's many places where they have to go to a central area to draw water on a daily basis. We watch them fill the jugs of water, place them on their heads, and walk back. And this woman at the well, you know what she was thinking. I want a means where I don't have to do this burden every day. A day cannot pass by that I don't have to be at this well drawing water. What she wanted was a way that she wouldn't have to do that anymore. And the Savior promised her living waters that she would not have to thirst anymore. My question, with all of that, and with all the promises that He gave her, did He relieve at all her need to come back to that well and draw water every single day? And the answer is no. She still had to come back and do that. Some of those burdens that are part of life don't get eliminated. They continue to be a part of our lives because that's how we grow. We don't understand it. We don't know why. But it's part of what we do. Sister Martino had the opportunity she flew in today because she stayed a couple of days longer in Texas because this daughter, Lauren, that some of you knew because she was for six months in, in, in Maracaibo. If you were there when we first arrived, so you got to meet her. And she's finding out what it's like. She just gave birth to our 17th grandchild, her fourth child. And they're all under the age of seven, seven and under. And so she's running around thinking, Mom, you're leaving today. <coughs> and she's a little nervous. <coughs> and she'll do great. But you know what? It's going to be hard. Can't change that. Your missions were hard. I talked to the missionaries in Central America and I said, Stop whining about the heat. <laughs> you guys don't even know. You ought to see what it's like in Bachacana. <laughs> Where's Bachaquero? I said, it's the hottest place in the world, and there's no place down here that compares to Bachaquero. I said, so stop whining, because you've got to realize that we're not going to change the weather. You're going to get what you're going to get. But you can change your own attitudes, and you can change what we do with the time that we've got. I'm reminded of two more scriptures. Our goals in life, really, not exactly how we taught them from the missionary lesson, but our, really our goal in life is to come here to this earth and to do all that is necessary to become sons and daughters of Christ. We come as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. <laughs> We need to return, not only as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, but also sons and daughters of Christ. I love King Benjamin's sermon, where he talks about this. 
And he says in that fifth chapter, and you'll remember this is when he asked them about what it is that talks about the change of heart and their desire to enter into covenants and things like that. And then in verse 7 it says, And now because of the covenant which ye have made, because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, you are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. Those covenants that you allowed so many in Maracaibo to begin to make. Those covenants that began at baptism that continue through the temple and continue through the covenants of partaking of the sacrament. Those covenants tie us to Him who is the author and the finisher of our salvation. When you begin to understand a little of the atonement, you begin to realize that it's those covenants that link us into that atonement. They allow us to, to have the fullness of the blessings of the atonement. All mankind is blessed because of the atonement. But it's the covenants that we make with Him that allow us to be benefit from the fullness of His atonement. That we can become His sons and His daughters. And that's what the goal is. That's how we can become perfect. That commandment that we've all been given, easy therefore perfect. But that Moroni answers in those last verses in the Book of Mormon when he tells us, two verses in a row, verse 32 and verse 33, that both have if-then clauses in them. If we can remain faithful then, by the grace of God, or by His atonement, we can become perfect in Him. And I'm saying all of these things because as I watch return missionaries, and as I look for some of your companions that I can't find, and I know are struggling, I worry. Not about you that are here. But I worry about a lot of the others. That don't comprehend that covenant relationship that we have. I hope if you've got some companions that might be struggling with it, that we can heed the counsel of President Monson and go out and rescue them. And put on them. Give them a little bit of an encouragement. Same thing with some of your converts. So fun to hear some of you come up and tell me. Brother Brosar came up and talked to me, and I remember the Pinto family and Magrita to tell me that their son is out on a mission. And I've had several others of you that have written to me or talked to me at different times about your converts that are out on a mission field or have even come home and things like that. What a tremendous blessing. Look at the lives that you've changed. But don't forget, when you were in the mission field and you found one of those golden contacts, how long did you have to wait until they got baptized? Two or three weeks? And in that time period, you expected them to stop drinking coffee, stop smoking, stop drinking alcohol, start reading the scriptures, start attending church. You wanted them also to, probably some of the men had a woman on the side, you had to drop, drop her. They had to make all of these changes in two or three weeks to get baptized, right? And some of them did it, right? We need to look at ourselves and say, what about the little changes that we need to make in our lives? How does our faith compare to the faith of those converts 
that we get so frustrated with when all of a sudden they drink that cup of coffee. And yet we as return missionaries need to find those things that we need to work on as well. And realize that those principles that we talk <laughs> apply to us as well as to our investigators and conference. It is so wonderful to look at you out here with spouses. To realize how many hours I would think about and ponder about changes of your companions from their mission field. And now I look that you've selected that companion that'll never be changed. You may have to worry about missionary service and missionary work that you have to keep doing, but you don't have to worry about us changing your companion. You don't have to be praying like you did occasionally. Heavenly Father, por favor. Didn't speed up, Presidente Martino, de cambiar a mí o a mi compañero, no me importa. And most of you went through some of those. I hope, because you learned a lot about yourself in those kinds of companions. <coughs> I'm going to close by saying this. When Sister Martino and I were sealed in the temple, the sealer told us to remember ten words. I probably shared this in the mission field. There were two letters each. And the words are, If it is to be, it is up to me. I've sat in too many counseling sessions as a bishop or a state president or other capacities. Or a couple would come in for marital counseling and either the husband or the wife would say, well, if she just change, then I'd do this. When many times it needs to be looked a little bit more introspective and determine what can I do to make this relationship even better. What can I do? Bednar taught us today in some training about the spirit of revelation. About how each of us as members of the church have the right to sacred revelation from God. I hope that you are knocking and asking that revelation to be a part of your life. You mean so much to Sister Martina and I. I know, I know that you loved us. But I don't, I don't think that missionaries realize the impact that missionaries are for the mission president and his wife. And how our lives are changed because of you. There's not one of you I can't look at and not have memories coming back into my mind. I saw Jake Sorensen walk up and the first thing I thought about was when he and I were able to go teach together for most of the day in the town of Rubio. I hadn't even thought of the town of Rubio in a long time. We found a family that day. They got baptized. It was a neat experience. That wasn't Elder Sorensen. That was Elder Schumer that I was there with. That was Elder Schumer I was there with. It wasn't Elder Sorensen. It was Elder Schumer I was there with. My mind reminded me it was a bit better, wasn't it? It wasn't Sorensen. It, it, was, it was Schumer I was with the Ruby. I even said it wrong, see? Sometimes I'm slow on getting it to come in the right way. The experience I remember, I just looked back there and said, that's what I was doing. They were in the same group, though. Some were kind of close, or just about in the same group. Or a group apart. <laughs> One group apart. Okay. Anyway. I'm going to close this after I bear my testimony, and then we're going to get to talk about each of you and how you're doing. And we'll visit. But I want you to know that we love you. We care about you. Our Heavenly Father cares about each of you. I'm grateful for the wonderful people that you are. I know how missions change people's hearts. 
I will brag a little bit on the Central America. We now have almost 2,200 missionaries from Central America serving in the world. Almost totally self-sufficient in, in, in those countries. And it's growing dramatically. And that'll change, it'll change Central America as they come back. It'll change Venezuela with four missions and 400 Venezuel Venezuelans serving missions all the time coming back into the country. Elders and sisters, I want you to know that I have had sweet, sacred experiences that allow me to testify that I know our Savior lives. I know that He leads and guides His church. There are times when you go through your own struggles that you may wonder because it just seems that there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Joseph Smith saw what he said he saw. He saw the Father and the Son. This gospel that we talk and that we continue to teach will change the lives of everyone that accepts it. And I bear that witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
to be together and to feel the spirit and to bring back all the memories that we had in Venezuela. We're grateful for this time we've had to hear from the Martinos and to feel their love and their spirit. We're grateful for their example and for their devotion to thee and, and to the gospel. At this time we ask a blessing upon the refreshments that they uh, bring nutrients to our bodies and allow us to go forth this evening. Watch over all those members and investigators and missionaries in the sacred land of Venezuela that they may be able to continue to grow the gospel and to hopefully have a temple in their vicinity. We're grateful again for everything that Allah blesses us with when we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. Amen.